Hello lovely people, how are we doing? Welcome to the weekly roundup. We have tons of news to go through this week because there's so much happening right now. It's going to be a long one, but I'm sure you don't mind. Let's start with some announcements. Diablo 4 had a campfire chat talking about the upcoming season 4, which is also delayed by about a month. Which is probably good news. We're getting a public test realm, which is nice, as people can now test the game's seasons before they launch and provide feedback. There's a complete overhaul of the itemization, in particular the affixes. No more damage on Tuesday afternoon memes, but instead much simpler and much more powerful affixes. Just damage, just intelligence, but also things like resource generation on hit or on kill, which is pretty great. D4 will also get smart loot, basically less loot drops, but it's of much better quality, something that some Path of Exile systems have as well. You can get uniques earlier already in World Tier 2, and even uber uniques have a chance to drop randomly after level 55 in World Tier 3. There's going to be some actual crafting in the game now with the new tempering system that lets you slam on affixes by using manuals and they also add masterworking which is sort of a 2.0 version of upgrading your gear at the blacksmith and jeweler. I'm not gonna go into all of that right now, I would just recommend you watch a Rax video on it, he explains it all very well. The Codex of Power is now an incremental upgrade and all aspects will be in there, so each time you salvage a legendary with an aspect you upgrade the existing Codex aspects, making them stronger over time and giving you something to grind for. This is something people wanted for a long time and while they're late implementing it, it is good to see that they actually do. I will say though that all of these itemization changes look incredible. I haven't really seen a single drawback yet and if all of this gets properly implemented it should be way more interesting to find loot and also way more interesting to manipulate and min-max your gear bringing D4 much more in line with competitors like Last Epoch and Path of Exile. There's more like a new endgame system called the Pit. Some other systems are getting overhauls too, like more density in Helltide. And of course, we haven't seen anything about the actual season, because there's going to be a season 2 with a seasonal mechanic. Overall, very good update, but let's not count our chickens before they hatch, we're dealing with Blizzard here after all. Then Path of Exile, which also disclosed their new leak. And it is another certified banger of course, starting with the leak mechanic which is basically a lantern that lets you put mods on monsters every time you enter a new zone. It's almost like metamorph, but then for entire monster packs. I'm sure it's going to be as deadly as a juiced up metamorph though. Of course, the high risk high reward philosophy is still in place, so you better bring a strong build to this league or fail miserably, like I probably will, because I'm still going to try and make my own build, or at least not follow a guide to the ladder. With the new league comes a new crafting system too, where you bury the corpses of the enemies together and use their properties to craft new gear. This could be a lot of fun in SSF and I can't wait to try this stuff out. It seems very straightforward and I'm quite curious to see what's going on with this. There are a bunch of new uniques and reworked uniques as well. The new Wraithlord helmet looks absolutely broken for example. You'll be running around with at least 7 specters rather easily and you can go much higher than that with additional investment. The game introduced a new tier of maps, tier 17 maps which drop fragments to the uber versions of most bosses, Atlas passive trees got completely reworked and now have loadouts or 3 versions so you can easily swap your atlas tree, the scarabs are completely reworked, they are now much more interesting, plus all masters can spawn at once in a single map. That's pretty nuts if you think about it honestly. It also simplifies the endgame grind quite a bit, plus some tedious systems were heavily dumbed down or just flat out removed. And of course, we're getting some new skills in the form of more transfigured gems. I'm incredibly excited to try all of this out personally. I'm leaning towards starting with a necromancer once more, maybe popcorn SRS this time. I really enjoyed playing SRS last league and with the new necromancer changes it could be a rather tanky build 
in time maybe i'll swap the specters after finding that wraith lord who knows i'll be using that srs build to farm up some transfigured gems in the lab and then likely decide on a second build before unlocking the entire atlas i have a whole league for that there is no rush and i think i'll be focusing the first week primarily on just trying out some builds and skills see what works what doesn't and then make up my mind Maybe I can even turn one of the builds into a bosser, another into a mapper and maybe a third into running content like Heist and Delve. Time for some patch news. The Slormancer released the Encyclopedia update version 0.8 bringing this indie ARPG gem closer to completion. That patch brings a codex which answers the most frequently asked questions regarding most mechanics, stats tooltips have also been added displaying current value and valuable information to all the stats that may appear on skills or upgrades. There are a little over 200 achievements added but steam achievements will be added later in the 1.0 release. The profile menu has been reworked to look more modern and better reflect the actual content of the game. Click to move has been reworked and should feel more natural to use and the devs made numerous changes that could drastically improve the performance of the game. Deep Rock Galactic Survivors released their first update, the Salt Pits. As you might suspect, it brings the Salt Pits, which is a new biome, bringing the total number of biomes to 4. Furthermore, the devs added 2 new enemies, 3 new artifacts and 3 steam achievements. They tweaked the requirements for unlocking new hazards as well. Next to this, a significant number of weapons and artifacts received a buff. I will say though that it's a little bit of a shame there aren't more enemies being added because the enemy variety isn't all that great and there's still only one boss, the Dreadnought at the end, but still, very fun game, doesn't break the bank, it's really cheap and I can absolutely recommend it. Last Epoch keeps hotfixing, sometimes making some weird jumps in the process if you ask me, such as reverting the change in cost of Despair Glyph Prophecies. The initial change was made before 1.0 was released, it got stuffed and stuck in the pipeline and just finally got out without further design review on timing. And now they are reverting that change again. That's fine, this stuff happens. But the LE devs then also write half a post about the reasoning. And at the end of the day, we're talking about the cost of a super specific prophecy. I mean, I think we may be going a little bit too far here with the transparency and explaining everything to the community. I felt the same about the survey. Relying too much on what players think is going to cause issues in the long run because players don't know what's best for the game and they only think in their own self-interest. And in this case, it seems like such a non-issue that I don't understand why it is not just a line in a patch note without further clarification. And I wouldn't really bring this up if this was just a single instance of it happening, but I feel this is happening now all the time, especially after launch. Trailer time! I saw a trailer of Ada Tainted Soil, a top-down 2D pixel art ARPG. I'm not sure anyone is making a distinction in pixelation between pixel art and pixel art, but as far as pixel art goes, this looks very pixelated. It's like coarse-grained pixel art we're talking here. Ada, however, despite not having many pixels, does look like it has a lot of soul and charm. The game is breathing indie. The combat looks interesting enough. Steam lists a bunch of mechanics like brewing potions, handcrafted zones put together procedurally, fast-paced, skill-based combat and tons of exploration. This is set to launch in Q3 2024. Then Mirthwood. This simply struck me as very interesting. It's basically The Sims, but then with a cool art style set in medieval times. Embark on an enchanting journey and brave ferocious creatures in an immersive medieval fantasy world. Will you settle a new homestead to live a life of farming and trade or pick up the sword and take on the adventurer's path? It looks great and is planned for Q3 2024. Flintlock released some more gameplay. The more I watch about this, the more I want to experience this game. I feel they're really hitting a good balance here, a good mix between impactful combat, a stunning world and just overall fun ideas to implement. It doesn't seem pretentious at all and these updates prove to me they have a good idea what they're doing. It's still early days, I don't think anyone has actually played this, but this game is supposed to release later this year and I'm looking forward to it. 
I thought this looked pretty interesting too, an Italian souls-like. In Notria, the last song is a souls-like set in a beautiful sunlit world inspired by Italian folklore where the brightest sun casts the darkest shadows, where unique role-altering masks face formidable foes and alter reality with the power of our door to unravel the secrets of Enotria. I know some of you hate souls likes because every time I talk about these games you put that in the comments. I feel though that the genre has a lot left to explore and sunny Italian scenes are among those. Let's just hope the combat is decent or the whole scenery simply doesn't matter. Here's a cool concept. What happens if you make a third person survivor game? Well, the answer could be Hordes of Hunger. Vanquish an onslaught of monsters in this 3D action survivors like. Take control of Myra to defend your homeland from a living hunger, build powerful weapons and abilities and save others from the advancing hordes. The big question is of course if a survivors game will ever work in third person, especially because after 15 minutes the builds tend to get completely insane. I can't imagine you'll be able to see what's going on anymore without a top down view. But hey, who knows. In the last trailer of this show, I just thought this was a fun one. It's a city builder where you lead a cult that worships Cthulhu. I mean, that's pretty original, I would say. Looks fun as well. It's called Worshippers of Cthulhu and it launches sometime this year. Then some games that released and yeah, we'll be talking a bit about Dragon's Dogma 2. Apparently an amazing game as it has an 89 on Open Critic, which is a very high score. But also it runs like ass on most PCs right now because it's another instance of a bad PC port and there's this whole debacle about the microtransactions. Performance is likely to be fixed in time, so just wait for that and then get this one on sale. But the MTX thing in particular is kind of sad. It's a single player game of 65 euros. It ships with 21 additional MTX for another 44 euros. And some of those MTX do in fact enhance the experience of the game. They give fast travel locations, they unlock features that you would otherwise have to be unlocked by playing the game. They're not all cosmetic is the point. They provide minor advantages to players which has sparked a whole discussion on if this is pay to win or not, which is completely the wrong discussion to have. It's wrong because it doesn't matter. What matters is that these MTX are completely unnecessary. They're only in the game to make additional money. They're not funding anything because this is a single player game, so there are no servers or additional development costs. And if these MTX really don't matter that much, like some people say, then why are they there to begin with? Why not just put it in the base game like you should? And the situation understandably completely backfired. Steam reviews are down the drain currently. All in all, it's just sad that such a highly anticipated game by so many players, and apparently a good game as well if you can run it, is marred by these MTX and the discourse around it. Capcom should know better, but clearly some higher up executives don't care about this stuff and jammed MTX in a single player game. They may have made more money by selling the MTX than they are losing money due to negative publicity, but having the game sit at 46% rating on Steam, I mean, that's gotta count for something too. It's definitely hurting the game. Personally, I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money, but I will tell you how I'll spend mine, and that is by waiting until this game goes on sale. At that point, the performance issues are likely solved and the price of the game may be more reasonable as well. Moving on to some games that I played, some Path of Exile, a bit of League of Legends, Lux support in Bronze 3 of course, a cute indie RTS game called The Wandering Village, that's still early access but I can recommend it, it also runs great on the Steam Deck, I just play this game in bed or on the couch. I'm playing still some Elden Ring, trying out a new build I've never played before by fellow Dutch content creator Nizar GG, very funny guy and a great editor, can recommend this channel a lot. And a bit of Helldivers too, which got a lot harder since they added flying monsters. I'm not spreading as much democracy anymore as I used to, that's for sure. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching and making it to the end. Don't forget to subscribe for more episodes. See you soon. Love you all. Bye bye.